Yes, it's another Friday morning and we start with Mob Deep and Survival of the Fittest, the tune that will be the signature for this this uh, weekly uh, session where we have uh, Crunchfish uh, in center of everything. Uh, and today it's time for uh, gesture interaction. Uh, every fourth week we uh, talk about that and it's a very inspiring, uh, fascinating talk we will have today. Soon more about that, but first of all, Hope you're all welcome. Uh, you feel fine wherever you are, uh, sitting in front of your screens around the world. Um, hope it's a good. Fr well, it's it's Friday the thirteenth, the thirteenth. It's it's bad luck for well they say I don't know. Let's try with the with the panelists. Uh, good morning, everyone. Mm -hmm. Morning. 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 Plenty of you, Joachim's, and uh, one uh, Niklas. Uh, uh, welcome this morning. Is it is it. Um, any any bad luck today? You were you were Kim Somers on? Um, I don't I don't think so. I am. I it's it's quite exciting to have uh, you know um, a guy from Helsingborg uh, doing the presentation. I think I think I think it feels uh, it feels all safe really. Oh yeah, well you're 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 like a well, a club Helsingborg, the mob. <laughs> uh, so uh, well, most welcome you are And let's go to Niklas. You will be the presenter. Good morning. Thank you very much. Good morning. So, what about bad luck? Good luck? Has it been a well? It hasn't been so much of a morning yet. Yeah, we'll see. It's still plenty of time, I guess. So. <laughs> yeah, uh, and then we have uh, Joachim Niedermark. Good morning. Yes. Good morning. Do Do you really well realize? Oh, Friday the thirteenth. Do you have any stories in in the past about bad luck? Um, not. To really, actually, I, I I'm not that superstitious, so it's, uh, I think it's uh, just another Friday, and uh, <laughs> it's uh, exciting to uh, to be in this uh, webinar. I think. Yeah. Uh, and actually, I, I realize we have we uh, we we are broadcasting from south of Sweden. I sit in Lund, and uh, the rest of you in Malmo and, and Helsingborg. And uh, I realize the the most famous person from this region is the well known uh, ast astronomer. Tycobrahe, and uh, very close to Helsingborg. It's um, okay. so it's V and the little the well actually he ca he came from Knudstorp. Did you know that? No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, well he lived in Knudstorp and and then he moved to V and and actually when he got really uh, well it, then well, this was the six, 16th century I believe when and he wasn't really nice to the peasants around there so. At the end, they well, he felt uh, not really secure uh, on his um, island, so he felt, oh, oh, let's go to Prague. The well-known astronomer went to Rudolf uh, II, and he, he got in charge of the Rudolf II and said, okay, you're the well-known astronomer, you'll be in charge of, uh, I need to find out what are, uh, during a year, what are the days for good luck and the days for bad luck. And he found... <laughs> It wasn't really what he was uh, were aiming for, but uh, that was the job he got. So he actually, uh, he found out that it was uh, about four days of good luck, but about, about 30 days of bad luck during <laughs> a year. So that's why some elderly people say when it's a bad luck, a day for bad luck, it's a Tukubra dot. Do you know this? No. Interesting no. you on. Thanks. Yes. For, uh... <laughs> well, a morning of wisdom, a morning of knowledge. Yes. Okay, I don't know if we can suit that into our subject, neural network. Uh, you, you will talk about that, uh, Niklas. Uh, so tell me, tell me, you are a machine learning expert, Northlink. What is what do, are you doing at Northlink? <clears throat> I work with uh, some very interesting companies. Crunchbase is one of them. Um, yeah. Doing machine learning, um, it's a lot of neural networks, just uh, state of the art, and what we're going to talk about today. So yep. uh, we work a lot with uh, optimizing things for images, uh, videos, and um, yeah, I've been working with Confish um, on and off for uh, the last couple of years. So really excited to be here. Okay, great. Then you are Kim as a CEO of of uh, Crunchfish Gesture Interaction. How important is uh, well neural network network to your to this uh, well to your product? Yeah, it's uh, it's crucial. Uh, I mean, we we base our uh, latest uh, products on, on neural nets and especially the parts that uh, that we will talk about today also related to this um, what we call hardware acceleration where we where we really can 
fine tune the network for the, the specific uh, processing units uh, that really brings up the speed will be, uh, I think, or hopefully exciting to, uh, to listen into today. So, okay, uh, great. Important uh, indeed. Yes, so yes. the idea now is to that we, we'll, we'll let uh, Niklas well mm -hmm. run in all the directions mm -hmm. he wants and then we will come up with uh, some kind of discussions. I have a couple of questions for you mm -hmm. and of course if you're watching this and you want to contribute with the uh, with questions please do that. Use the chat forum or uh, or the forum at uh, I, I believe we have a link through um, uh, LinkedIn as well. So please ask your questions uh, through use that chat forum and I will be glad to pass them on. So uh, are you all prepared to listen to Niklas? Yes. Yes, Indeed. great. Mm. So Niklas, let's, uh, well, let's start and uh, we'll see what, uh, what will happen. And uh, it, I'm very curious about this. So go ahead. Thank you so much. So welcome to this uh, webinar. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, neural networks today. Some background first. So at Crunchfish, we use uh, neural networks and image analysis to do a couple of very interesting things. So one of those is static poses. So we can identify static poses, which is basically a, a thumbs up, can be a static pose. These can be used in, in mobile phones and AR and VR glasses to identify uh, different poses and estimations. We can also do dynamic gestures and uh, tracking. So we can see, for instance, how your hand is moving. Uh, for instance, if you want to use a digital whiteboard, we can actually uh, track your hand and see what kind of poses and where your hand is moving. And then we can do skeleton regression. So basically we can identify key points in your hand and in your skeleton, which we can then use for pose estimation. And we can do it for uh, advanced things to identify how your hand is moving and in, in what direction. So these are like a, a core concept where we can use uh, different combinations of these to then build very advanced features, for instance, for AR glasses. And we use neural networks for all of these. But the background, if we go back to 2013, when we started out with this, we had a more um, simple version, which uh, was a selfie or, or our glasses um, solution. It was based on basic image analysis and was used mostly for mobiles and tablets. And then we upgraded that in 2015. And we used it for AR smart glasses. It was still based on image analysis. And later on in 2018, we actually moved this up to neural nets, which is a huge step up. So back in the days when we used a lot of uh, image analysis and not neural nets, things are a lot harder to get that intuition. And neural nets is actually helping us do that. So instead of actually having to hard code every single feature into these algorithms, we can use neural nets to actually find a sense of intuition in these models. So the model is self-learning in a sense that it can identify things that we haven't told it to identify. And that can be actually used to uh, improve this algorithm a lot. And we've kept on working with neural nets since then. So right now we're using 100% neural network based methods, which is a huge uh, upside for us because these models are a lot more advanced. They can do a lot more powerful features and they actually have a self intuition is mostly what I would call it. So our XR skeleton platform right now is 100% neural network based. We're going to keep doing that in the next generation and keep on using neural nets and augmenting these models as much as possible. So it's really, really interesting features. <clears throat> and basically what a neural network is, is that it's a combination of what's called layers. So a neural network takes in its core an input layer, a hidden layer, as it's called, and an output layer. And basically the input layer can be something as an uh, image. In our case, it's an image of a hand. It's then transformed into multiple hidden layers, which is basically a lot of what is matrix multiplications, a lot of mathematical modeling that's going on in these hidden layers. And these hidden layers are trained with millions and millions of uh, data points. So we're actually feeding these networks a lot of data and it's improving itself um, as it's trained. So these hidden layers have a lot of data. They're called hidden layers because they're hidden in between the input and the output layer. And the output layer is basically where the magic happens. 
So the output layer can be something as simple as a, a binary classification. It says that this is a hand or not a hand. In our case, it's 21 images, which is basically a point in each hand. So it's outputting a lot of points in a hand, or it can output uh, a single pose estimation or a gesture. So we combine these, like we put in the image into the input layer, and then we train a lot of these hidden layers to actually refine the output layer. And these models can be really, really huge. And we've worked a lot with optimizing these because we're using it on mobile phones and we're using it on AR glasses, which is also pretty hardware restricted um, <clears throat> setups. So we have to actually optimize these net neural networks a lot to be able to have the performance that we have at Crunchfish, which is um, very interesting. So these neural nets, they are trained with millions of data points. When we train this, we try to optimize, it's called a loss function. It's basically a way of defining what works. So we can say that our loss function is a way of identifying how good are we at regressing key points in a hand or identifying gestures. And then this model is by using a lot, a lot of data points, it's optimizing this loss function and trying to reduce it as much as possible. And this can be done in millions of iterations and the loss function is by small, small iterations improved and then refined. So a key point here is that we need a lot of data to actually be able to make this loss function adapt to a certain image domain. So by using a lot of data, we can make the loss function adapt to a sort of a, a general type of images. Uh, if we just had maybe 10 images, the model would as it's called overfit, it would understand that it only needs to learn these specific 10 images. So we need a lot of data points for it to be able to adapt to versatile settings as we use in Crunchfish. So we train this by generating a lot of data. And actually a lot of these neural networks based applications, the data in itself is probably the hardest point to overcome. So you need a lot of data. And <clears throat> when neural networks started to take off, the the core concept, and it still is, was that you got a lot of data points, a lot of images, and then you annotated these images. Like someone actually sat and identified, here is a hand, here is a point in a hand. This is very, very time consuming. So it takes a lot of time to annotate a lot of images. It's not a, a very automatic process. <clears throat> and the iterations are very slow because of it. But uh, at Crunchfish, we've used something called a synthetic data. And synthetic data, is a, basically a concept of taking a, a representation of an image. It could be a 3D model, for instance. And that 3D model is then adapted to a way that it looks like a real image. And then the neural network is trained on that. And then we try to optimize what's called the reality gap. So it's basically a way of tricking the neural network to understand that this synthetic data, which are not real images of hands, should actually be interpreted as real images of the hand. And this is one of the key features that we use at Crunchfish. So because of this, we can iterate a lot more quickly and generate a lot more data because we don't actually have to annotate all of these images by hand. So we combine that and then we can create a pipeline. We, we basically can iterate, we can train, see the results, then improve these neural networks in small iterations, generate new data that makes the network more refined. We can use our annotation tool to generate more data, and then we can optimize the neural network to adapt to this domain as much as possible, which is a big upside if we compare this to the old way of doing it, the more classical computer vision method, where we actually had to hard code these features. Now we can generate a lot of data and then make the neural network adapt and get an intuition for that data and sort of self-learn on a specific domain. So we call that concept uh, domain transfer. It's basically a huge model. It can adapt from various types of domain as well. So we can generate data that looks like, a, <laughs> like a, from a, a heat camera or a stereo camera, a regular camera. And we can make these images in a huge amount and then adapt the, these to the neural network. And we can combine them into 3D features as well because they're generated in a synthetic fashion. 
So using this synthetic data and these neural networks, the way of making these networks understand what's the core inside the image is basically a combination of that we take the image, so the image of a hand, and then we put that into the network. In our case, we transfer the image into um, the network with three inputs. So it's uh, three channels, as it's called. It's a red channel, and a blue channel, and a green channel. And then we train the network to optimize this and output 21 key features in the networks. So each feature is a point in a hand. And the image on the right there is actually the output from the network. So we use that output to then refine a model that understands how the hand looks. So neural networks are great at adapting to very versatile data sets. Um, they can be trained in huge amounts of data. The downside is that they can also be very slow. So when a lot of players started out using neural networks for image analysis, they moved a lot of it to the cloud and they had huge data centers where you analyzed a lot of images, which is very costly and can be very slow. And there's also a lot of problems with uh, Wi-Fi connections and things like that. But the last couple of years, there's been a huge revolution in edge inference. Edge inference is basically a way of running these neural nets directly on the device. So new hardware um, manufacturers are implementing specialized hardware inference directly into the phones and in the AR glasses, which are really good at running these neural networks really, really fast. The problem with it is that you have to optimize these neural networks for it. So we have to refine our architecture to actually fit into how these neural networks can be uh, deployed on these uh, edge devices. So at countries, we've done that. We've optimized these networks. We made them very slick and, and be perfectly adapted to these edge devices, which is then gives us the possibility of running the inference directly on the device, which speeds things up a lot and scales a lot better. So this execution and the execution times of these neural networks is key because we're running this on videos, so we're running this on, on hands and continuously, and we want to do that as fast as possible. So we're trying to use this specialized hardware inference on the devices to optimize this. One key feature that we're using is something called quantization. This is basically a way of taking this big neural networks that is trained with millions of data points, and it's training something called a float number. So it's used for more specific precision. But what we're doing is something called quantization. And that basically shrinks the model down to a smaller type of representation that makes the network a lot smaller, but also more optimized for running directly on the edge uh, unit. So by using this, we speed up the neural network a lot, which basically allows us to keep a high frame per second rate. So we can run this network a lot more often and a lot faster by using this quantization process directly on the device. And this has been a key feature of actually being able to use these neural networks, these really large networks directly on the phone and still having a high accuracy and still having a high performance. So it's a very exciting technology and it's sort of new. A lot of players are starting to adapt it. It's starting to be used more and more, but I think we're really on, on the edge with these points. <clears throat> so to sum down, what we're using neural networks for is basically to replace this old computer vision technology and make these models more intuit intuitive and more adaptive to a broader range of uh, images. So it, it can be used in a lot more um, broader context and it can also be used with a lot higher accuracy than we could previously do. And then we use synthetic data to train these models with millions of data points, which we can generate a lot faster than manually annotating these images. And then we use quantization to shrink down the models to something that can be run extremely fast directly on the phone, which basically gives us a very fast <coughs> tool chain from going to a big neural network down to inference directly on the phone, which is a key point in making these models work very well for our consumer device. So yeah, 
thank you very much. A quick introduction to what we're doing with Neural Nets uh, at Crunchfish. Well, great. Thank you so much. Very spot on and, and inspiring. Uh, thank you so much uh, for that, Nicholas. Uh, plenty of questions here. And uh, before we invite the, the other two, I'm just curious about, uh, well, the quanti uh, quantization. Is that your feature? Is it a current fish feature or is it a worldwide spread uh, open source yeah. feature? It's a, it's a concept um, more than a, a feature itself. But I think what we're doing is that we've uh, been very early in adapting quantization in our neural net. So I think we actually started out using quantization um, at, at my first, when I just started out working with uh, Crunchfish. And I think we were very, very early on. Um, most of these big uh, machine learning frameworks had still not adapted the quantization at that point. And we actually wrote some of the code that we then upstream to these big uh, machine learning projects because we were so early on that concept. So I think we were really, um, really early in using quantization in neural networks for these and, 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 and when you say early, are you, well, years ahead or, well, a couple of weeks ahead? <laughs> How fast <laughs> is it? No, no, I mean, like, things are going very fast in, in the machine learning community. I think we were uh, a couple of years before, we started using it a couple of years before it actually got adapted into, the, like, the mainstream frameworks and things like that. Yeah. Of course, it's, a, it's a more of a concept, but I think we were very early on uh, and mm -hmm. starting using it uh, in a practical sense. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, you Joachim and Joachim, uh, just curious about your reflections. Let's start with Nudemark. Uh, listening to Nicholas, what are you, well, what are you focusing at? Uh, I, I think the, the last part we talked about here is, uh, it's really exciting and, and it's sort of making a huge difference uh, for, uh, for our technology, especially in, in the AR environment. So uh, talking about this quantization, basically it's, it's a matter of being able to, to, to run our uh, neural nets or our technology, not only on the CPU, the central, central processing unit on a device, but able to use the specialized processing unit, which is the, uh, the NPU or, or uh, generally did the DSP. Uh, and, and in order to do that, you need to have this network running uh, quantized, so to say. Yeah. And, and we are brought down. So uh, the importance here is that uh, the the time for processing every image coming into sort of the system uh, is uh, sort of what uh, uh, what decides how quick and how good the performance is. Uh, we have brought that down to sort of below five milliseconds. So so we we can run and and do this network um, running in less than five milli milliseconds per image, which is uh, a huge a difference between running it on, on a CPU, for instance. Yeah. And, and that really increases the, um, the, the speed and the performance of, uh, of the system. And, mm -hmm. and also, if, if you have a, like a, 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 a less good hardware as such, uh, we, can, we can also in that environment, if there is an MPU or, or a DSP, we can, we can still sort of make this work really well, which is also an advantage. Uh, so we, we see that there is a huge request on, on this and also the combination of using the stereo sensors. Uh, uh, so we are really excited about um, this step we have taken now. Yeah, uh, thank you. And uh, you are Kim uh, Samuelsson. Um, what do you think are the key, key messages here? What are you curious about? Um, I, I think it's, um, I want to thank you, Niklas. Uh, thanks for a great presentation. And uh, I, I think it shows, um, um, you know, how, how much of a leading edge company Crunchfish is. Uh, th th this is really uh, state of the art. Um, Joachim, uh, I think he brought home some key points that we can process these uh, networks on uh, really quite uh, uh, sort of basic chipsets uh, simply because we've made this software uh, so efficient and and one of the steps here that uh, we were very early on uh, early with or as Nicholas was saying was quantization but but it, but it's also Crunchfish as a whole uh, having done the whole process uh, of how we work with training data we N Nicholas mentioned this sort of uh, image domain transfers uh, that we can create this, uh, which is the hard step as well uh, to, to do that. Uh, the, it's the whole process. Uh, and, and we have it, I think all the pieces now here at Crunchfish to uh, be able to perform. And it's, um, 
Uh, me being more close to the digital cash side, but but it's uh, it's just amazing to see uh, technically how advanced we are on the gesture side. So it's uh, yeah. it's it's really nice. It's really oh, nice. great. And uh, we got a question here if, if from the chat forum. It's Timmy uh, Allen Gord, uh, and he asks: Then your neural network can even run on a hundred and twenty hertz camera, um, Nicholas. I guess in more of a, a sense that our networks can run on devices that previously were not an option for us. So older phones, um, we can run, but we can also run them a lot faster on more modern phones and we can improve the performance on those phones. So it's a combination of running on older hardware, but as well as optimizing for uh, newer hardware where we can get a lot more bang for the buck, basically. Yeah. But uh, what about the, well, when I, well, sometimes here at the Friday mornings, I really get in contact with the new concepts, new words, and I really try to, to cope with it. But then neural network, I've been, well, hearing that for a while. So I just wonder, it, how come has this become, well, hot now uh, as, as a front runner? It's, it's quite old, old, old thinking in, in many ways. Yeah, definitely. Um, so... There was basically uh, sort of a, a revolution. Uh, I think it was back in 2012. Um, there was a, a very famous paper that came out no, where no, no. neural networks was basically, everyone knew that neural networks was uh, a very interesting way of doing things, but they hadn't been practically applied to these sort of problems before. And then there came out a paper that actually showed them to have a lot of potential in using in practical senses. And then after that, like the research just exploded and a lot of these, you know, the big players uh, got into neural networks and they started releasing a lot of more papers that explained how to do various things. And since then, the um, like the pace of the research has been uh, like amazing. It happened so much the last 10 years. And I think both in more of like a, a broad range of research, there's uh, some very huge companies that are doing like this uh, you know, the, the broader range of research. And then there yeah. are official like, companies that, uh, like Crunchfish, that are using, like, these neural nets to solve a specific feature extremely well. And I think that was previously not possible. And uh, I think we're seeing that neural nets are actually um, redefining what we thought was possible with AI and machine learning, um, mm -hmm. given, if we look back 10 years. So, so so what will happen when, when, when the quantum technology really takes the world? the big strides in, in, into what what will you be enabled then? Well, it's hard to say. I think if we look back 10 years or 20 years, I think we're seeing now that we can actually do a lot of things that we thought was previously impossible. And there's an old saying in AI and machine learning that AI is basically whatever a human can do that a machine can't do. And that boundary has been pushed a lot the last couple of years, and it's still being pushed. And now we're seeing AIs that are generating art directly from user input, and it's of really high quality. And we're seeing it in medicine, and we're seeing it in post-estimation, as Crunchfish is doing. So there's a lot of things happening, and it's very hard to say where we're going to be in 10 years. But I think the important thing is that we're actually pushing the boundaries right now, with specifically with using neural networks and how we train them and how we actually are able to solve problems that was well, impossible like 10 years ago. Yeah, and and, and uh, what are the, well, if you compare to other other methods, uh, uh, what can you do with other methods that you can't do with neural network and, and, uh, and vice versa? Yeah, I think that's the cool thing with neural networks and it's also one of the, the hardest things with it is that it's, it's sort of a, a, a black box in a sense. Like you, it's, not an exact science on how to make this work very well. You, you can adapt a lot of knowledge and you can understand what usually works and you train them with a lot of data. But in the end, there's so many parameters in these neural networks that it's impossible to say, all right, I want to change this specific bug in the network. Uh, that's like the hardest thing because you can't tell the network to just stop doing that. <laughs> it's like there's so many different uh, combinations of data points that are going into these networks. That's but, are you, but, but are you in control then? 
you're, you're in a, the control in the sense that you're defining the network and you're training with a lot of data. But as I was saying, you're training up sort of a intuition in the network. And that intuition is refined with a lot of data points. But you can't really change one specific thing about the intuition. Like you can improve intuition in a, in a broad sense. And that's what you're doing with neural networks as well. But if you compare that to a more traditional computer vision sense where you hard code each feature, then it would be more easy to pinpoint that specific thing that you want to improve and, and just change it. But yeah. of course, you're not getting that intuition, that like intelligence that you're getting with neural networks. And those models are not performing as well. And they're, they're just more simple. And I think that the cool thing with neural networks is that as you broaden your experience with this, as you work with it, you become a lot better in understanding how to make these neural networks perform at the optimal level. And I think key is just building a very good team that are really good at building neural networks and just keep on doing it and refining and trying to augment the solution to that problem. I think that's what country is doing. So it's very cool. So, so what about the very, well, on a consumer level, we talk about gesture interaction when it comes to some, well, all the, what can you do with these, well, the neural network that you can't do without them? What, what can you just on a, on a very, very concrete level, uh, what will it enable when it comes to interaction? I, I think in general, if I just may make the, yeah. the comment, uh, uh, that you have much more details on, on the hand, which enables uh, uh, a lot more flexibility in the interaction that you can do. So uh, bringing it into context like uh, the automotive or the, the augmented reality. So take the augmented reality, for instance, if you have uh, these virtual objects or you have this menu that is on this virtual screen in front of your, your eyes, uh, if you want to you know, uh, touch a button, to, uh, for example. Uh, there is a huge amount of flexibility in how how you can do that. And, and that is what you expect as a user as well, that you should be able to push that button um, as you like. So if you use a finger or the whole hand or whatever, it should work, right? And, yeah. and that kind of, uh, of um, uh, possibilities is, is opened up by... Uh, the, the the skeleton model and and all these data points on on yeah. each hand. Yeah. Joachim is uh, Amazon from a, from a overall uh, since you're well group CEO country from a business perspective. What will this enable you as a company? You think these technologies? Well, I I think this this is a game changer as um, yeah, Joachim and Niklas has talked about, and I, I think if we were with what we call the, these classical algorithms, um, we wouldn't at all be able to solve the problems that we do today. I, I think the two two areas that we're getting into, um, sort of with automotive, as you can say, as well as they are, uh, we need to be here uh, because I think the the neural nets itself, uh, the way that they perform, is an order of magnitude better than these sort of classical uh, algorithms. Uh, so we, we need to be here in order to deliver um, uh, technology into this area. If we were, if, if we had stayed at our uh, previous generations with classical algorithms, I, I think we wouldn't have uh, at all been able to address the problems that we uh, that we are doing. So it's, I think it was absolutely paramount that we. Uh, Quite early, uh, as Nicholas was saying, I think uh, when we started with neural nets, this was sort of back in 2017, 18. Um, yeah, I think it was a very important shift that we did there. And, and, and as Nicholas was saying, uh, the whole team of Crunchy has been pounding at it uh, since then and uh, refined because there, there are many there are many skills here uh, that needs to work in combination. And um, if we hadn't done that, I think we wouldn't have been as uh, sort of leading edge in, in this area as we actually are. So I'm, I'm, I'm very proud of the gesture team. I think they're doing an yeah. amazing job. But then what about the, well, uh, disadvantages, the, the difficulties with the synthetic, uh, synthetic data? What, why doesn't everyone use it this world? For training. No, I don't think there is any disadvantage with synthetic data. It's just data, but but then as um, this also was part of Nisa's presentation that you you need to make the synthetic data behave and and be uh, for for the computer look like sort of real data. Uh, otherwise, you will have a bit of a gap there. But but I think we. Uh, the, the great thing with syntactic data is that you, you can uh, automatically generate it. Uh, you need the, these models needs uh, millions and millions of uh, training data. And uh, by having it synthetically uh, derived, 
uh, you can do that in an extremely efficient way. Uh, we, we talked about that uh, four weeks ago with uh, with Daniel with, with this image domain transfers that we 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 are able to build this uh, data sets uh, in days. In, uh, it always used to take sort of months before uh, to to build the data sets, uh, but now we can do it so quickly and 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 synthetic data and doing these domain transfers as we've uh, been really good at uh, as one another component. Niklas touched on that, but but it's a whole it's a whole uh, spectrum of of skills that needs yeah. to be put together in order to make this this work. So but what, what what are the but, but Nicholas the, what are the difficulties then when because the well even if there's plenty of opportunities here what what, what are you struggling with with some direct data per se or yeah well with this uh, use usage of uh, of um, neural network technology um what are the do we have any what are the weaknesses what are you struggling think, with as Joachim was saying I, I don't think there are any weaknesses I think it's just a, a refinement but I, I think it's as we were saying earlier I think the important thing is doing this is like, it's not just throwing a lot of data into a neural network and then call it a day and go home. You have to keep on doing it and you have to refine it. You have to build like the experience and build the experience in the team. And there's so many components from generating data to actually training these models and making, understanding what works and understanding the, the domain as well. So I think yeah. it's a skill set, and I don't think there are any weaknesses in it, but I think it's just a, a way of you know, building up a really core, strong, experienced team uh, that are really good at doing this. And I think that's a, a huge, huge upside. In, in Here's a question I, I, I got, uh, I don't really understand, so you will help, help me with this one. Can all network architectures run on DSP, that's NPUs? Can you explain well, for me what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. So, um, Basically, the, these neural networks, they are designed, as I was saying earlier, they're built on layers. And a layer is basically a way of doing a specific like, operation on data. So it can be transforming the image or downsizing it, so like uh, making the image smaller or bigger, or things like that. And this network is doing that in a lot of these layers in combination. Um, and these architectures, there's a lot of different architectures that can be used to make these models work. but the DSPs and the NPUs, these specialized hardware um, units, they are optimized for certain different types of layers and different types of architectures. So you actually have to refine this network to have an architecture that fits into the network. It's basically making a, a model that fits into a specific hardware. And then you have to make that model perform at an optimal level as well. So that's also a skill set, understanding what works on a mobile phone, what can actually be executed at a very high performance, and what can actually then be trained to achieve the same performance as a larger model that could, you know, that are not able to be executed on the mobile phone itself. So that's also a big skill set in this and understanding what can be um, quantized as well. So it's a huge, I mean, there's some, as Joachim was saying, there's many, many boxes here that needs to be ticked. And there's so many skill sets that needs to be adapted to this to actually make a, a really good solution. It's, um, it's such, it's really complicated in a sense. Mm. When, when, uh, when you, well, get hold of these uh, technology, when you, when you buy the program, will, will they be fully trained or will you need to, will, adapt to the consumer, to each individual, uh, a new training well, session? Um. We trained these networks um, before they were shipped out to the model. So it's not uh, training itself uh, as you are using it. Then, and actually that's uh, an upside of using synthetic data as well, because we can generate so much data from using synthetic data that we can actually adapt to so many different uh, circumstances that we don't need to train it directly on the phone as well we can okay. skip it and have it being trained on a very broad sense what about 3d and 2d do, do we need to have this on the 3d level or, or could it work on on a 2d 2d technology yeah we're doing both uh, right now we're uh, we're training these on on 3d features and 2d features as well so yeah and any and, and, and well what will the 3d uh, version will enable 
so the 3D features basically gives us a, a sense of depth as well. So that gives us more flexibility and understanding uh, how a uh, gesture is performed or how the hands are moved or tracking the, the hand. So it's uh, more uh, of a refinement, but it's also a, a more complicated process. So in some senses, we don't need 3D and then we can use 2D instead, which can be, well, it's uh, less complicated, so it can be faster. So it's actually- Can, can you use this technology on, well, recognize such things as, as a, a facial expressions and, and can it be used in, in that way, even if it's not gestures? Yeah, yeah, in, in a sense, that's, that's sort of a post estimation. Um, if you track features, in, for instance, in a hand, you can understand how those features are combined together and then understanding what kind of uh, pose that hand is. And in the same sense, that could be done in, on, on any parts of the body, I guess. Yeah. If, if I'm a, a question to all three of you, if I'm in the remote control business, I'm very heavily, well, I'm going into remote controls. Uh, what can you say about it? Will, will, will they, well, will be a story of, well, of the past using remote? Um, um, you are Kim Nudemark. Yeah, so um, you, you can see that in different contexts. So we, we can talk about a remote control, for instance, uh, in front of the TV. And I think, yeah, that, that will, uh, I think, disappear. Um, but also we, we can see that they are using uh, uh, hand controls for, for instance, uh, virtual reality uh, helmets and stuff. And I think that, in a sense, will also be be uh, sort of replaced with with hand controls. Oh, sorry, with with hand uh, interaction uh, instead. Then, then I can see that for maybe certain games and stuff, you maybe want to hold something in your hand just for for the feeling of it. Uh, that is one thing. But but I think the interaction as such is is definitely something that could be used by by your hands, um, and that is what we will see. And then augmented reality, you don't want any hand control for sure. So that's uh, where hands is uh, is the key, uh, I think, for the for the interaction with this kind of. Product. Niklas, if you if you go on the on the visionary side, and and well, what can you what can you paint? What kind of picture do you paint in the future? Where where will you are Kim Nino, Mike, you started talking about situations where we, we will be totally behave in a new way. What can you add on that? I think if we look at some of the largest companies right now that are going into the, the VR space, so, so take Meta, for instance, they're investing huge amounts of money into uh, the VR space and building a Meta universe. And I think there's so much money going into gaming and virtual reality gaming. And I think the potential there is immense and I don't think we really know where that's going to end up. But I think what we do know is that using AR glasses or VR glasses, that's going to need you to use your hands. And having these physical devices that you uh, hold, for instance, is not a, it's not a great solution for it. You, you want to understand how the hand is moving and you want to understand what kind of gestures that is doing. And I think this technology can be combined with that to actually make a really good experience. I think it's the same thing if you go into the industry and using AR glasses. Well, it's going to be a key feature to actually understand what your hands are doing for you to be able to use that. So drawing on a virtual um, virtual whiteboard, for instance. It's not going to be really nice if you have to have a, a digital pen or something. You just want to do it with your hands. And understanding hands and understanding what you're doing is a key feature of making VR and R work really well, I think. Um, and if you look at how much money and how much time and effort and really good engineers that are working in this space, then I think there's a lot of potential. Yeah. And, and what about uh, lighting conditions, uh, light conditions? Uh, what do we need to, to get this technology to work in? in... Well, it's, it's good if it's not pitch black. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well. Thank but, you. I, Thank I, you. I, but even even there, I, I think uh, we uh, another industry, we talked a lot about AR, VR now, but uh, automotive. Uh, in your car is, is typically quite dark, uh, but but then you use a sensor, you use infrared, so you you shoot infrared sort of, and and then you yeah. you can use that data instead. So even so, in, so even, even in dark infrared, area, it, yeah, it, it, it works with in infrared as well. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So so yeah. because basically you 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 don't want to or let, let's uh, 
let's use it automotive, but let's light up the car. Uh, that, 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 that's, that doesn't really work. So, so, um, and, and, and we've, we've done a lot I hear, of... Yeah, well, pl plenty of this in the car, you know. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but I, I think it is, uh, automotive is another sort of industry where, to be a bit visionary, that where th there's so much going on in this area from a regular uh, point, uh, perspective that they, they, they want... Uh, uh, the car manufacturers to understand what's going on in the um, in in the car in order for for safety reasons. There is coming a lot of requirements on that, and and for that, I think this this type of technology is absolutely crucial uh, to be able to deliver on on uh, on these things. And the, the yeah. this is not far away into the future at all uh, to see this this happening. Since we we gather uh, under the the theme of survival of the fittest. So who will survive? What, what will be needed in this area? What's the, the, the way of thinking to be one of the, uh, well, the actors who will be, well, up and running in 10 years from now? What are the, well, the, the core ideas you have to uh, adapt and adopt, um, Niklas? I think the core uh, adoption here is that things are going very, very fast in this area. Um, and I think the kind of companies that are not continuously pushing uh, their boundaries here and uh, trying to adapt and use new technology, they're going to fall behind. And we're going to see like new players that are adapting this technology and solving problems that we thought was not possible to solve previously. And it's going to, I think a lot of things are going to change in, in that sense. Uh, so I think the key here is just adapting new technology, uh, continuously pushing, building an experience in this, because it's a new, it's new for a lot of companies, new experience, new kind of competences that are needed. And you need to build up a core team that really understands this and can work with it. Yeah, and you, you talk, uh, and, uh, you talk about automotive, uh, Joachim Samuelsson. In what areas do you, do you, do you see that uh, this will be having, having a huge impact? Well, as I said, safety uh, in, the, in the car. And, and it's a regulatory yeah. requirement. They, they, the, it's absolutely sort of... Uh, I don't think there is any other way to really solve this, uh, that uh, the the regulatory uh, sort of car traffic safety departments are, are asking the car manufacturers yeah. to do then to deploy these kind of network because i th and i i think the technology has come now uh, i think as you said before neural nets um, uh, it's sort of a, as a concept quite old but but it requires uh, as we talked in this uh, webinar uh, it, it requires quite a few components uh, uh, in order to work and i think the the technology for these uh, necessary components has catched up so this old concept has now become a reality because I think the the components that is needed is there, and 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 yeah. the, the, that's continuously being refined as a quantization, as we we mentioned. Uh, it's been one technique that come a bit late, but now when it's here with these sort of better processors, um, then it's possible to do even more better things. Uh, yeah. So it's um, pushing the boundary. I, I really think that to continue to adapt. Uh, you know, in best Darwin style, really, the it will be the survival of the fittest, even here. Yeah, and and just uh, I'm thinking of a of a huge area like healthcare. What are the what possibilities? Uh, yeah, just well, just uh, curious about uh, what the possibilities you you see, uh, Niedermark. Yeah, so so indeed in that area as well. So if we we look at, for instance, rehabilitation, uh, how to do certain exercises and and follow up on that is is definitely one. One very interesting area for both hand, but but also the uh, the body body tracking. So, uh, and and I can see uh, also for for training and education that is uh, to some extent uh, started, but uh, it's it's early days where you can you know train uh, for surgery and stuff. And, and and again, you need to be able to track your your hands and being able to to see what's what's going on and. Um, uh, I think uh, there is huge opportunities in that space yeah. as well, for sure. So, uh, and uh, Niklas, uh, what are other areas to help help us understand where we will meet this technology? I think, uh, as um, Joachim mentioned as well, I think in, in training... They're, bo they're both Joachim, so you have to we'll be more specific. That, that makes it so easy for me, you know. <laughs> for me as well. But, uh, no, but I, I think uh, the opportunities in... Uh, 
like education and in the industry is a huge as well because you can actually use this technology to um, help people but augment them so you can understand when you're doing something wrong and give them feedback and actually combined i think a lot a lot of the potential is combining computers and, and humans so like making things better by getting smart input so we can help you to uh, well learn faster for instance in in healthcare i think that's huge i think for some uh, areas in healthcare, there's a lot of patients that have a lot of um, tricky equipment at home. And dialysis, for instance, you can actually help people to uh, to understand and learn faster to use the, that equipment at home. And for doctors to do remote surgeries, I think this could be very useful as well. In, in the industry where you have to do a lot of very tricky, complicated procedures, it can be very useful to understand that well, you're doing something wrong here, or you can improve this, or you're getting feedback um, at the moment when you need to do something very complicated and you don't have access to both your hands to be able to look yep. it up on uh, a computer. I think that's going to be huge. I'm, I, when I got into the, uh, well, the VR and AR uh, area, and I, I really understood, and I, I felt this will be have a huge, huge in, impact in this technology as well. So uh, when it comes to... to uh, spaces in our homes our, our, where we live in our, do we all need some kind of uh, well you must have a couple of square uh, square meters to be able to do this your your thing will will it will it uh, change on the way of how we how we draw uh, buildings and and uh, well how how we live just to enable uh, places for everyone to have their own studio their own interaction space uh, do you think that will happen I think that you, you can vision, vision, be visionary in, in that space as well. Maybe not with, with the space as such, but imagine that you're using uh, augmented reality now. Uh, you could, uh, maybe in the future, uh, you and your wife could have, for instance, uh, different uh, settings in your home. You could have different curtains. You could decide that uh, I want a painting here, or I want a TV there, or I want you know, anything, colors, uh, and you can have your, your colors and your wife can have hers. And uh, the, the system will keep track on which, uh, which house you are in and which room you are in and where everything is. Imagine that. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it will be, well, exciting to, to see what, what will happen. So final question, uh, the next step. Um, we, we see the possibilities, uh, well, and we don't know what will happen, but what can you see in the short range? Uh, uh, what are the important steps? Uh, you are Kim Sommers and you start. Um, for us, it's to deploy it. Uh, and um, I, I think um, some, of the, some of the things that has happened very recently for us, um, if, if we talk AR, VR, you know, uh, we have this uh, uh, stereo vision that we have, that, that, that creates a better field of view. We have much better algorithm with this uh, quantization. Um, uh, we have this uh, domain transfer things. These are things that we just developed in the last sort of three months. But that, that is, opens up uh, opportunities for us. And, and I think we are we, we're getting a lot of good traction from uh, big, big sort of multinationals. And, and it, for us, it's now to package what we have and, and uh, let them... Um, um, understand uh, how good it is for their products. Likewise in automotive, um, th this is the other field that I think is really hot right now because of regulatory requirements. Um, we, we can package what we have in that area as well. So I think we, 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 we've taken, I think our technology recently um, to uh, another level, a new level. And, and from that, I think it's, it's all about trying to exploit the market opportunities for us. We'll continue pounding on it, making it better. But I think the next step in the, in the short term is, is, uh, is actually commercialization of it. And, uh, and, and I think there, there is really good sort of, uh, Joachim Niedemark uh, will be able to comment on it better. But I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm hearing from the grape wine here in the office, uh, there, there are good things happening. Yeah, great. So uh, let's go to Mr. Mr. Niedermark then. Yeah, no, no, I, I can just agree that, uh, I mean, we have, uh, we have concluded already that we have been uh, rather early out with this kind of advanced technology and, and we, we have something now that is state of the art and what, what is happening now is that the, um, the, the receivers of this and, uh, and the, uh, 
the, the possibilities for the use cases is is really taking off, and um, that is what uh, I think we we see now. And and it's also clear that if we talk about, for instance, the uh, the, the the automotive, there are now regulations coming, which is uh, a very good thing for us. In the AR space, we see that the requirements on uh, the uh, the consumer glass versions of, of AR, the, the, there are like industrial ones and, and consumer uh, focused ones. And the, the consumer focused ones is for sure the ones using this stereoscopic. And, and, and that is what we get now in the interaction with, with consumer electronics companies in, in, in the US and, and Asia. So it, it uh, yeah, it, it looks very promising, and I just uh, look forward now to to bringing this to uh, to the next level. Great, uh, and uh, from our expert Niklas, what do you see in the short term? Uh, I, I agree with both uh, Joachim. Uh, I think the very cool thing here is that we're actually going to start using this. Uh, where it's so much more complicated to handle working products that you know that handles all the various edge cases and i think the technology is really mature now and we have something very cool and that's going to be applied to real use cases um and i think that's uh, really exciting well great so well thank you uh, all three of you niklas joachim and joachim for this uh, inspiring discussion i hope it was uh, uh, it it was uh, very uh, fulfilled with uh, it full, full uh, filled with with uh, facts and uh, uh, possibilities and you all, uh, that you all got inspired by watching this. Otherwise, you will well just post questions and and we will answer them later. So thank you so much for telling us about these uh, uh, this technology, um, Niklas and uh, Joachim. Joachim, let's just look into the future. The next webinars, Joachim Sovelson. Yeah, um, I'm heading for India, and uh, on Friday, uh, the, our are, head of are, India will are be. They, are they prepared? Are they prepared? They know uh, you coming. I, I think they are prepared. We we have a we have a really great. Uh, it's gonna be gonna hit Delhi first, and then uh, Mumbai, and then Bengaluru, uh, the <laughs> new name for uh, Bangalore. Uh, so yeah. we, we, that, that's gonna happen on that uh, that week, and then. And on the Friday before, uh, our head of India, uh, Vijay Raghunathan, is going to give a, um, you know, an, an, a good picture of what, what's going on in India for us, really, in digital cash. Uh, mm -hmm. We will have our country's chairman will be presenting on uh, country's governance uh, on the 27th. Uh, I hope to be able to join uh, from India uh, yes. uh, during that week. June 3rd, must, uh, we'll be back to digital cash. We'll, we'll talk about uh, the use cases for digital cash, uh, give a, a good feeling for that. And on June 10th, uh, we're back to gesture again. And then um, we're going to look at the um, quite mature pattern portfolio uh, that we have in, in, in this area. So um, that's the plan for the next sort of four, four sessions that uh, we'll do. Great. So you all know what to, do, well, to look forward to uh, here. And uh, I can see that my... <laughs> My computer's battery is down to one, well, 2% now. So it will just ending it when it comes to breakfast time. And I know that's very important at Crunchfish. So uh, thanks all for participating. Uh, no malfunctions, what I could see it, this Friday the 13th. Knocking, knocking wood here, uh, as we do in Sweden. And I don't know if they're doing it in other countries. Well, it doesn't matter really. So uh, have a nice weekend. Uh, thank you for your presentation, Niklas, once again, and all. Take care. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Thank you. Take thank care. You. Bye, bye bye. Let's put on some music, Joachim. It's almost on. Yes, we got it. But you're not dancing. You're not dancing, Joachim. Yes, there we got it. Just dancing with you, Johan. <laughs> See you, everybody. Thank you, for, thank you so much. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.